Hello again, fellow mud wrestlers. Uh, it's not often I feel confident making a pronouncement on the shifting sands of philosophy, but I'm pretty sure that the biographical fallacy is a fallacy. Now, this view is, in a way, kind of modern. The idea that once an artist is known to have some character flaw, then his or her work should be avoided, is a part of what's currently known as cancel culture. Whether it be the zeitgeist deciding that a certain person should not be allowed to make money from their art, or whether it's a personal decision just not to enjoy some art that you might have enjoyed, who knows, because you know something unpleasant about the creator. A student of mine, a couple of years ago, told me that she'd never watched a Woody Allen film because it was Woody Allen and you weren't supposed to watch Woody Allen films. Because, 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 well, there was some unspecified something that I'm still not sure exactly what he's supposed to have done. We had the Kevin Spacey incident lately where his films were all taken off platforms because he was accused of something which he was later cleared of. So it is quite a current thing. And even I will admit to a disinclination to listen to Metallica after having heard that they went bear hunting for sport. There's also a Sid Vicious story I'm not going to repeat, but knowing what I knew about them coloured my idea about how I received their art. But here's the thing, it shouldn't. Sid Vicious's version of My Way is probably still the best cover version. Metallica is a damn good group. Whether or not they kill animals for fun, it might be uncomfortable to think this, but try these on for size. Here's a book I read, which I thought was uh, excellent by a Norwegian author who was previously unknown to me. I read that one after, this is more famous book about a poor person struggling around Oslo, literally on the verge of starving to death, and winner of the 1920 Nobel Prize for Literature. Pretty good stuff, I thought. Then I found out that in World War II, Hansen was a fully signed up Nazi. He even met Hitler and Goebbels. After the war, he was arrested, tried for treason, and committed to a hospital rather than a prison because he was a bit old. Does any of that make the book that I read less entertaining, less worthy, less well written? I suggest that it doesn't. Here's a groundbreaking film director if ever there was one. Innovative, highly respected, that should be a coup for the feminists, shouldn't it? Unfortunately, it's Ms. Riefenstahl, a friend to the Nazis, as was Mr. Speer, who of course was only following orders. Now, you may or may not like his style of architecture, but a lot of people think it's pretty classy. So here, we're not talking about censorship, as in, look at the scandalous content of Lady Chatterley's Lover a book you would not want your wife or servant to read, or Lolita, the disgusting, lascivious outpourings which doesn't contain a single swear word. We're kind of more along the lines of these guys. This art is bad for your soul. In fact, censorship at its root will always have an, a moral tint to it. The big debate now about freedom of speech used to be the left that were all in favour, now it's the right. But then I heard a left-wing commentator on a radio programme criticising the right for being hypocrites, saying, well, these guys, they're all in favour of free speech. <laughs> Imagine that 30 years ago. But anyway, yes, the pendulum swung. You guys, you're all in favour of free speech, but you want to censor books in your children's school. There's too much of this trans nonsense going on. And you want to clamp down on demonstrations in the street. But in fact, the clamping down bit was clamping down on speech that incites to violence, which is part of British law, and I think correctly so. And I also think, like most free speech advocates, that is the line that you should draw. There are certain lines. This commentator happened to mention the two principal ones. One, incitement to violence. There should be a point at which that becomes criminal, shouldn't there? 
and the other one children whenever we discuss laws we make an exception of children i would have thought at least in in most cases not concerning rights but concerning the rights of passage if you'll excuse that awful and unintended wordplay we don't want six-year-olds drinking we don't want ten-year-olds driving cars so the other reason for censoring is a lot more in line with the Islamic prohibition of criticism of Muhammad, the Nazi book burning, the communist repressions, and in this particular case that I'm looking at, the biographical fallacy, I think it's entirely wrong-headed. And here's why. How about I give you this lovely tale to read? Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, and then I ask you your opinion of it. I wouldn't expect you to have to look up the biographical details of the author before giving your opinion, which is, of course, why it was a rollicking tale. Now, the reason you can't do that in this case is we don't know who wrote it, and we don't know who wrote this. Tom Pierce, Tom Pierce, lend me a grey mare All along, down along, out along Lee for I want to go to Widdicombe Fair With Bill Brewer, Jan Stewart, Peter Gurney, Peter Davy, Donald Widdham, Harry Ork, Old Uncle Tom Cobbley and all, Old Uncle Tom Cobbley and all And we don't know who wrote this This was all my joy Once thought Henry VIII wrote this. And Henry VIII wasn't very nice, but it didn't stop everybody singing it. But now we think it's somebody else. And that, my friends, is my disappointingly simple assertion of the biographical fallacy. Or, in summary, it is possible for great, meaningful, and valuable artworks to be produced by complete and utter